Kick your shears off, sit back and relax, okay? This is a sermon that I hope will benefit every one of us. And I'm really glad that the people that I have before me today are experienced Christians, experienced in several different ways, so that you will understand what I'm about to say. Because without that understanding, most people will take one listen to this sermon title, since it's about eternal life, and they'll say, I know about that, I have it, I have Jesus, and they'll write this sermon off instantly. Yet there's way more to it than that. Do you remember the story in Luke, and this is not in your outline, just listen a minute. Remember the story in Luke in the 10th chapter about the man who was set upon by robbers and left for dead, and first came a priest by, and he crossed the road and went by the other side, so that he didn't have to deal with the injured man. And then came a Levite, which is of kind of a holy house of Israel, and he too ignored the man. And then came a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews because the Jews didn't think the Samaritans had a proper religion at all. And the Samaritan not only took care of the injured person, but took him to an inn, handed over two denarii and said, help the guy, and if there's any further bill, I will come back and pay that later. I think it's appropriate for eternal life stories to know that story, because the question is asked in that scripture, who is my neighbor? And Jesus described the Samaritan as the neighbor, the one who had helped. Then he turned around to the person who had asked that question, and he said, Go and do what? Likewise. Got it. <laughs> hey, give yourself a pat on the back. A plus here. Go and do likewise. John 3.16 says, and this is from a modern English Bible, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the question that's old as the hills, and it is, is when does it start? I'm ready for mine a lot of times because of pain and problems that occur. I'll bet you are too, okay? When does this everlasting life start? Some people believe that when the soul leaves the body, eternal life begins right then. Oh, it can, I suppose, and I have felt souls leave the body. In fact, many times, when you're very near to someone who's dying and you hold them in your arms, you can actually see. I do not know how this happens. I know you can see a presence that leaves the room. Okay? Some believe the soul moves out of our body and eternal life becomes a reality. God can do what God wants to do, can't he? <laughs> Some believe that eternal life has to be waited on, an event in some distant and heavenly future, and that may be true in some cases. Only God knows for sure. And some believe our eternal life believes on the day of our resurrection of Jesus, following our physical death. Certainly that may be true. But those are people's viewpoints. And the Bible has some specific things, and I think they're exciting. Every one of these viewpoints are held by people. But they don't always necessarily coincide with what the Bible said. So what I want you to do today is let's lay aside any human viewpoints that we have, and let's just go over some Bible verses. This is not a lengthy sermon, but I think it is important. In the Bible, Christ always spoke earnestly about the necessity of accepting Christ as soon as the hearts and minds of people decided to. When Jesus spoke to people about this subject, he used an urgent calling, a do-it-now kind of urgency. 
And then Paul comes along, and he's a great messenger of the living Christ. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Eternal life is one of the great Bible doctrines, and I'm glad I know about it. But so many people run it down or belittle it, okay? So many people embrace it, but they fail to ask themselves. Any reassuring specific questions about eternal life? And if they are asked about it, they don't answer with the knowledge of the Bible. They have vague answers and beat around the bush. And that's why I think so many human viewpoints exist. By the way, I found over 30 human viewpoints. I'm just glad I only mentioned three. <laughs> right? Right? One of the things I hope all of us take home with us today is a new and exciting outlook which believes without any doubt at all in any of our minds that eternal life is an experience that begins the minute you and I have our soul trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And why not? Jesus wants all people to become acquainted with the requirements of their heavenly citizenship while they are living on earth, we need to know where we're going, why we're going there, and the reason for it. this eternal life is named Jesus. That makes our religion real. You can't have a religion that's real and believe in pie in the sky by and by. It can't be done. That divorces you from the reality of Christ. I believe Jesus is walking right here among us today. Is he? Nod your head, yes, it's true, it's Bible, okay? Can you see him? But he's here. The spirits that have crossed over are often beyond us. I do not attempt to explain that by rhyme or reason. That's how God wants it. I'll accept it, okay? Is the Holy Spirit here inside each one of us today? Yeah, because I ask it to be. There is no understanding of Scripture. I, I, can, I can spout forth words after words after words, okay? Wouldn't make any difference except that the Holy Spirit interprets them for each one of us because we each one have a different need, but we got the same Jesus. Jesus wants all people to become acquainted with their heavenly citizenship. And not only that, but Jesus wants every believer in Christ to know that their own eternal life is totally dependent upon their belief and their faith in him. You remember when a lady in the crowd came up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment and she was healed? What did Jesus say to her? He knew he'd been touched. Turned around to her and he looked at her. He said, your faith has made you whole. And she was healed and went on her way. That faith is what's important to our belief of our eternal life. No matter where we are, no matter what we do, no matter where we live on this earth, we are destined for a heavenly home the minute that Jesus comes into our heart as our Savior. Jesus. It's the only one by which this eternal life can be verified. And our belief in him is important. Last Sunday, how many of you remember last Sunday's sermon, word for word? <laughs> you guys are exempt. <laughs> okay. Of course you don't. You know how to look at that? I don't remember every sermon that I've ever heard preached. Thousands, I'm sure, by now. I don't remember every meal my wife has fixed for me either. <laughs> but I do know <clears throat> that I have to buy a slightly larger pair of pants every time I go to the store, and I remain well-fed, don't I? From each one of these aspects of our religion, and this eternal life is included in it, we are fed spiritually with an assurance that other people don't have. You don't get this assurance in a lot of places. 
I've been in some churches, I walked out just as empty as I was when I went in. That just didn't register. Perhaps this will. Jesus was doing, what was he doing on the cross? I'm still on last Sunday sermon now. Why didn't he just jump down and save himself like they told him? If you had a Jesus, come on down. Okay? And he wouldn't do it. Why? Because he was willing to hang there on a cross of service and death so that our souls could have a pathway to heaven and eternal life. Jesus is our Savior. We're not inviting Jesus down. We claim by our very presence here today that we don't need the proof. What we are being what, asked to do is to find our way up to Jesus so that we too are willing to hang upon the cross where we give up the world. Jesus said very plainly, he said, you know, you're not of the world anymore. You're living in it, but you're not of the world anymore. We're special. Now don't go get in the big head. Don't leave here with a swelled up pride just because you're special. Jesus speaks with great authority. John chapter 3. I'm starting with verse 1 and I'm going up to at least verse 17. I've been considering adding a couple, so bear with me here. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named who? Nicodemus. Remember when I preached that first sermon a few weeks ago on Nicodemus? And I told you then, I said, I do think I could preach 50 sermons from this. <laughs> okay. Well, this was one that came to mind. He came to Jesus at night. I'm in verse 2. And said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, in verse 3, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And here's Nicodemus' human thinking. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear a sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes, I'm in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I put to you that we have, by great authority of Jesus, the same thing that we're looking at here. We look ahead to John 4, 23. 
The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that same truth had the power to break the grave, didn't it? The stone rolled away, and that allows us to do exactly the same thing. The silence and the fear of death has been broken by Jesus. Now, do I hear any amens? Amen. Do I see a smile? Okay. You see what we do? Sometimes we get so involved in the spiritualistic parts of this that we forget that this is our gift now. It's our gift right now. The same authority of Jesus over the power and the fear of death is seen in Ephesians 5, 14, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. Amen. Amen. Divine forces working on human hearts and divine consequences as a result. Do you have a perfect preacher? Sorry. Be very careful here. He's been known to have an ego. No, you don't. Are any of you perfect? No. My wife and I have decided how we're going to handle the tensions that are currently upon us. We've decided to wake up in the morning and scream a lot. <laughs> but isn't you? Isn't that how you handle it? You're so frustrated. <clears throat> okay, until you finally decide. Until you finally decide. We can handle this. We'll do it with help. The only son of the only God that has ever existed. Don't you dare be misled by others. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I want to be sure that we remember and know this because we're building our bridge to Jesus. I don't care what your status is in terms of age or family position or anything else, but I do care that you have a positive outlook on life in spite of things because Jesus does not need us to be negative. I'm surrounded by a whole world of negative things, and I get tired of it. Much rather have the smile on my face. I saw this on a... a uh, obstetrician one time, he delivered a baby right then. It was an emergency situation. I was standing in the hospital and I looked in. The child was delivered. He held the child up. The child cried and I wish you had seen the look on his face. New life, isn't it? New hope for a nation that's condemned without Christ. That's what we are. We are babes in Christ. We're babies. Jesus goes back to the beginning of the entire universe. I've got a book at home, a science book. It has a picture of a hand. And in the hand is a thing about the size of a grapefruit. And it said, this is the entire universe at 10 to the minus 32 seconds after it began. I thought something like 30 trillion, 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 something along that line. <laughs> okay. And the whole universe was the size of a grapefruit if you subscribe to the Big Bang Theory. That it started with God, and God said, let there be light, and he opened his hands, and there it was. <laughs> if you subscribe to the world's theories, it was a bunch of dust and dirt that collected together by its own, what, gravity? Shame on us. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, said Jesus. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now there's something we need to remember. As soon as we built our bridge of faith and we came to Christ and we confessed Jesus as our personal Savior, we were raised through this baptistry into a new person. We went down as sinners that represented death in the tomb. We came up as living spirits in Christ. And the Holy Spirit was now at home in our hearts. Yeah. The results of eternal life are shocking to so many people. 
a lot of people don't realize this. First of all, by gaining your eternal life through your personal confession and acceptance of Jesus Christ, let it be known right here and right now that your eternal life is pretty much immune to judgment. <laughs> let me tell you why. John 5, 24. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Right? You've crossed over. Sometimes things come in what? In other words, do you only have one bad thing happen to you at a time or does it come in waves? Right now, I would say it comes in what? Tidal waves, doesn't it? Tsunamis. Been there, done that, haven't you? Okay, haven't you? Your world falls apart. Your world. I'm standing here on two feet for what? The second time in six months? It's been six months since this happened, you know. And I still have two holes in the bottom of my feet. But it's getting there. Okay? It's getting there. The sick lady that touched Jesus' garment, your faith healed you. The sacrifice of Christ killed all sin. And when we accept Jesus as our Savior, our sins are not even remembered by God. Have we passed God's final exam? Romans 5.33 Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And the answer is no one. So I say to you, congratulations, Christian. You're in the right place this morning. We passed. Now, will you still be held accountable for any sins? Get on your knees and pray. Admit your sin. And God will take care of it for you. Based upon your God and your presence of Jesus evidenced in your life, tell me something. Since you are now in the end result of the translation from Death to life in Christ, forever and ever, does your body and your mind and your spirit show it, or are you grumpy all the time? <laughs> Listen, it's easy to complain. We're good at complaining. My wife and I are a symphony of complaints, okay? So are you. Yeah, we are. Here's what Oliver Goldsmith once said. Now, he had in mind the economy, but I thought it was a really good quote. Ill fares the land to hasting ills of prey where wealth accumulates and men decay. You put your thoughts in your wealth, you've decayed. You've come off of Christ and put it in yourself. The real decay sets in when people magnify their physical and temporal existence, and they make God take second place in their lives. I've got people in my own family I have tried and tried to save, and they can't be saved because they put their possessions first and not their God. Saving faith is an operation of the heart. If your heart, and I'm speaking now to experienced people, okay, if your heart has grown old and cold with religion, what's wrong with it? If you came here today expecting a standard sermon and you're expected to walk out the door, you go out and, and you shake the preacher's hand and you say, that was good, or I'm glad I was here, or some sort of nonsensical remark, that's fine. I've done it hundreds of times too. But if that's all you expected out of your religion, didn't we expect too little for what we really have? Do you know what the best thing is about this forgiveness of God? 
It's not what you have to do, it's what you get out of. Okay. I always, you know, I, I tell you what I think of every time I think about this. In my house where I grew up, there were a lot of people. We had an icebox. We did not have a refrigerator. Wouldn't have known what it was. We had an icebox and a zinc, spelled with Z, okay? And it was a pan set on the countertop made of hammered out zinc, and uh, it had a pump on it. And the pump went down to the cistern, and that's how you got water for your zinc to wash the dishes. <laughs> And if you wanted hot water, you drew it in a bucket, put the bucket on the stove, got it hot, and you brought it back over and poured it in. Okay? Now, in this particular example, okay, we lived a life of necessity. If you wanted chickens, they directed me out the back door to the chicken coop and made me go catch one, wring its neck, and bring it in. Okay? After I'd plucked the feathers off of it. Right? And we had chicken dinner. Right? If we wanted pork for one of the dinners during the week, then we had to ahead of time drive to Crossfield, Illinois, to the locker plant down there where they kept the meat that we had processed. And we ordered up two or three packages of pork and we took them home. And as they thawed out, we ate them. Okay. If your heart has grown old and cold, then it's time to have yourself renewed. We never figured at our age to be overwhelmed by problems, but sure enough we are. <laughs> we thought we were going to travel carefree. There is no carefree travel. <laughs> okay. There's always, always something going on. We're the very ones God is trying to save to start with. And I want you to put yourself up on a little pedestal, not very high, but a little one, and say, I'm not of this world, I'm the next. And my eternal life starts now. Right? Positive. Now, can you look at me and smile? Did you pass God's final exam? No, that's yet to come. But the judgment of hell. You got Jesus and that's different. <laughs> and God loves you. Jesus lives and so can we. And sometimes it seems so all fired important to me to be of the ways of the world and to turn around to others that I think are wrong and tell them they're wrong and react wrongly with anger and not with Jesus. But there is an out here for all of us. Get on your knees and pray. Amen? Amen. Is it easy? I don't know. I only got one knee left. It's kind of hard to kneel down. Okay? In fact, Teresa's on her way over, I think, to get us a, a ultrasound on her knee right now. Okay? I already had my ultrasound. They said it was ugly. They put in a couple of steel pieces and a bunch of glue. And um, I can walk around. I think that's great. Okay. Medical miracles are great, but the miracle of Jesus is special. Amen? Amen. Join us. Our hymn of invitation, page 363, first and last verses.